All right, we now have slightly more complicated polynomials, which will make the decomposition a little bit more difficult, but also more interesting. And it will also invite us to ask two very intriguing questions. But before we get to those questions, let's actually solve these decomposition problems. And I once again encourage you to pause the video and try to figure out on your own how you would approach these problems. So when you spend a little bit of time looking at these polynomials, you realize that these decomposition problems aren't so bad, as long as you go after the coefficients in the right order. Let me show you what I mean. Let's look at the first example first and realize that if we went after this coefficient first, so we're looking at p1, we would have to conclude that it equals 5 because p1 only has the free coefficient. So our only chance to match the free coefficient in this polynomial is to set this coefficient to 5. We would be off to a good start. But then, when we go after this coefficient next, we will presumably try to match the x coefficient. So we would have to take 7 of this polynomial, which would indeed match the 7, but it will also give us an extra 14 in the free coefficient. And that will mess up what we achieved in the first step. So the whole process will be derailed. So this is not the right approach. The right approach, it turns out, is to start with the last coefficient. If we start with the last coefficient, everything will work. And it's not like it's a general rule. It's just a strategy that will work for these particular polynomials. If these were different polynomials, or even if they were the same polynomials in a different order, your strategy would have to change. But this strategy will work for these particular polynomials. Let's start with the last coefficient and realize that when we look at the last coefficient, that's actually our last chance to get the x squared term right. Because p3 is the only polynomial that has x squared. That's why we start with it. We get x squared right on the first step and then the subsequent steps because these other polynomials don't have the x squared term, that coefficient will remain correct. So that's why we're pursuing this strategy. So we're looking at the last coefficient and by matching the x squared term, we realize that we must take one of p3 because that is the only way to get the x squared coefficient right. So that part of the task has been accomplished and it cannot be screwed up by any of the subsequent steps. So we're off to a great start. Now that we've established this coefficient, we can go after this one next and match the x coefficient. And if we succeed, that will not be undone by the last step determining the p1 coefficient because p1 does not have x in it. So let's determine this coefficient. So we have to match the coefficient of 7. 7x. But that doesn't mean that we should take 7 of p2 because we already have 1 of x from p3. So we only need 6 more of x. And because the coefficient of x in p2 is 1, we need exactly 6 more of p2. So 6 of p2, that's the second coefficient. So 1 of p3 and 6 of p2 takes care of x squared and 7x. And the only remaining part of the test is to take care of the 5. So let's see how much of p1 we need to take to match this term. So the answer is not 5 because we already have some contribution towards this term from p2 and p3. What are those contributions? Well, it's minus 3 from p3 and actually 12 from p2. So we have 12 minus 3, 9. So we already have 9 in that free term and we need to get from 9 to 5, which is of course accomplished by taking minus 4 of p1. So p1 is minus 4 and it's not at all 5, which was our original wrong guess when we went about our business in the wrong order. 
So we have solved our first decomposition problem with respect to these more complicated polynomials. And I would describe this entire process by the term bootstrapping. The term bootstrapping in mathematics refers to algorithms where at the beginning you may not know all the steps. Only the first step is clear. But once you accomplish that first step, the second step becomes clear. And once you accomplish the second step, the third step becomes clear, and so on. So the whole process is reminiscent of lacing up your tall boots. Thus the term bootstrapping, that's where it comes from. And actually, the same etymology applies to the word boot, as in booting a device or booting a computer. Because when you're starting a device, an electronic device, certain things need to happen in a very precise order. I don't know what those steps are because I'm not an electrical engineer, but I think it's clear that some things have to happen in a very precise order. So I believe originally the term was bootstrapping a device, which later got abbreviated to the word boot. So bootstrapping. We will actually rely on this approach to decomposition. And bootstrapping is actually a good way to describe not only the approach, but the set. I would call this a bootstrapping set of polynomials because it invites a bootstrapping approach to decomposition. So we'll rely on it a lot in this course because that makes for examples that are not too complicated and not too simple. In some sense, just perfect. So there you go, bootstrapping sets. And this is a bootstrapping set. So let's do another example with this bootstrapping set of polynomials. And once again, even though this polynomial is different, we would go after the coefficients in the exact same order. Because the order in which you go after the coefficients is really dictated more by the set itself rather than by the polynomial you're trying to decompose. Okay, so once again, going after this coefficient first, that coefficient needs to be 1. And we next have to get from minus 3 to, oh, excuse me, <laughs> messed up. So we're taking care of x squared. We will next take care of 7x, excuse me, negative 7x. And so far, we have 1x, so we have to go from 1 of x to negative 7 of x. In other words, we need to subtract 8x from what we already have. And because this x coefficient is 1 in this polynomial, we have to take precisely minus 8 of it. So the second coefficient is minus 8. And we can now match up the free term, which is 0. And let's see how much of the free term we have so far. We have a contribution of minus 3 from here and minus 16 from here. Minus 16 minus 3 is negative 19. So we actually have to take 19 of P1 in order to get to the term of 0. And there you go. We have solved our second decomposition problem with respect to this more complicated set of polynomials. So there you go. We're done with the task of solving these decomposition problems. Now what are the two intriguing questions that are begging to be asked? Well here they are. Question number one. What would you do if these polynomials were even more complicated? And they would only have to be slightly more complicated for the bootstrapping approach to completely fall apart. For example, if this polynomial was x or x squared instead of 1, the whole approach will fail. And these polynomials would then be too complicated to do the decomposition by sight. Right? We would have to find a more systematic approach to it. Now that's the question. We're, how are we going to do it? So we're not going to answer this question now, but the question is coming very soon. And it will involve linear systems and Gaussian elimination. That was question number one. Question number two, generally speaking, just how many polynomials do you need to be able to decompose any other, let's say, quadratic polynomial? So for now, the answer appears to be three. We had three polynomials in the previous set of examples where these were really simple. And, in these, and with these more complicated polynomials, the answer is once again three. We once again have three polynomials. 
So is the answer three in general? Generally speaking, with three polynomials, we'll be able to decompose any other quadratic polynomial? Well, the answer turns out to be yes. The magic number for polynomials, for quadratic polynomials, is three. Just like the magic number for geometric vectors in the plane was two. And for geometric vectors in the three-dimensional space, the answer was three. But in the case of geometric vectors, we were actually able to justify those answers by constructing an affine grid. Well, in the case of polynomials, we have our intuition, but we're not able to answer that question conclusively at this point. However, we will answer this question in exhaustive fashion in just a little bit in the chapter on bases and dimension. So the answers to these very important questions are coming very soon. And we will next turn our attention to decomposition examples in Rn.